Good afternoon. I'm Judge Patrick Bumate of the Ninth Circuit here in San Diego, California. Before I introduce our panelists, I want to say it's an honor to be moderating this panel. I've been uh, roaming the halls of the Mayflower Hotel for more than 15 years attending the Federal Society National Convention. It's a real treat to be on the opposite side of the dais for the first time. And I'm lucky to be moderating this panel in particular, since it's a topic I'm very familiar with. It's modern quandaries of law enforcement. I've been on all sides of the criminal justice system. I've worked as a defense counsel, as a federal prosecutor, as a policymaker at the Department of Justice, and now as a judge. So I'm really interested to hear what our panelists have to say. Our first panelist will be Heather McDonald. She's currently a fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a frequent commentator on the issues of criminal justice. She's the author of the book called The War on Cops. So I guess it's easy to tell where she stands on today's topics. Heather, thanks for leading off today. Thank you so much, Judge Bumatai. It's a real pleasure to be here at the Federalist Society. Uh, I'm gonna play right off the title of our... Can, can oh, you... sir, yeah. Heather, before you begin, I'm gonna introduce the rest of the panelists and kick it up back to you. Fine, okay. Thank you. Uh, so next we'll have uh, Larry James, managing partner at Crab, Brown and James, a longtime respected litigator. He has also served as the general counsel for the National Fraternal Order of Police since 2001. Larry, thank you for being here. Pleasure. Third up, we'll have Robert McNamara, a senior attorney with the Institute of Justice. He litigates cutting edge constitutional issues on free speech, property rights and economic liberty. He's also the founding member of the NYU Journal for Law and, uh, and Liberty. Robert, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Your Honor. And finally, we'll hear from Charles Cully Stimson, a, a senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation. At Heritage, he manages the National Security Law Program and is a recognized expert on national security, homeland security, and crime control. Cully, thanks for joining the panel. Thank you. And, and now, Heather, I turn it back to you. Go ahead. I apologize for jumping in. That's the difficulty with Zoom. You don't have body cues and, and uh, other, other signals for when, when the cue is actually coming. So excuse me. I'll start over. Uh, I'm going to address what I see as the biggest quandary facing law enforcement today, which is that officers and police commanders on a daily basis hear from the good law abiding residents of high crime communities a fervent desire for more law enforcement, uh, for more broken windows policing, for more cops on the beat. Let me just give you a sampling of some of the requests that I've heard attending police community meetings in high crime inner city communities uh, for the last 20 years, whether it's the South Bronx, South Central Los Angeles, or the South side of Chicago, I hear you arrest the dealers, they're back on the streets the next day. Why can't you keep them in jail? I've heard there's people, I smell pot in my uh, apartment corridor. Why can't you do something about it? There's youth hanging out by the hundreds on street corners fighting. Whatever happened to truancy laws? Whatever happened to loitering laws? I've heard people complain about uh, youth hanging out being truant in schools, it goes on and on. Uh, there's, there's a bar outside my window, they're sitting out there smoking weed at 2 a.m. The quandary facing police officers and commanders is this. They cannot respond to those heartfelt requests for public order without generating precisely the racially disproportionate statistics that can be used against them in a racial profiling lawsuit by either the ACLU or I fear by the coming Biden Justice Department, which is on record that it regards uh, disparities in law enforcement as prima facie proof of discrimination. The cops today are driven by data on where people are being victimized the most and by community requests for assistance. And given the vast disparities in criminal victimization, and this is a very uncomfortable thing to talk about, even greater disparities in rates of criminal commission, uh, the police cannot enforce the law. They cannot respond to requests for assistance 
without producing disparate impact. And the country has turned its eyes away from those disparities, not just in criminal offending, but in criminal victimization. Since the George Floyd riots of early June, dozens of black children have been killed in drive-by shootings without any protest from Black Lives Matter activists and without any notice by the mainstream media that views itself as so uh, righteously anti-racist. So until the country becomes more honest about where crime is happening, we're going to continue blaming the messenger. Are there bad cops? Yes, there are, but that is not the predominant problem in our law enforcement system today. The cops are the messenger. We're shooting the messenger. Unless we have more transparency about where crime is happening, uh, we're going to continue to be going after the wrong culprit. Of course, cops have to be held accountable. Uh, I would say the main problem is not... Uh, Use of force, study after study has shown that when it comes to lethal force, if there's a bias uh, in police shootings, it's against whites, not blacks, when you take violent crime rates into account. And the minimal look of non-lethal use of force uh, that we've seen from, say, Roland Fryer has not adequately accounted for office for suspect resistance. Uh, but the real problem, I would say, with policing is attitude, uh, courtesy, respect. That needs constant work. Cops do yearn for more tactical hands-on training that would minimize the chances that they find themselves in a situation where they don't have backup, they feel they have no alternative but to use lethal force. Uh, we can always do more training. Implicit bias training is a complete waste of time and money. I've attended it. It's an insult to officers' uh, experience and knowledge. More tactical training is necessary, but I would say the big critical issue facing the country today is more honesty about the great disparities in criminal offending. And I'll stop here and just throw out, just as a, as a chaser, a few statistics. Uh, in nationally, Blacks commit homicide at eight times the rate of whites and Hispanics combined. They are victims of homicide at the ages of 10 to 43 at 13 times the rate of whites. Those Black homicide victims are not being killed by the cops. They're not being killed by whites. They're being killed by other Blacks uh, in an equally disproportionate rate of, of homicide commission. So I'll just end there and with great anticipation, hand uh, the podium off to Mr. James. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me give you a little bit of background. Um, um, I don't know where that echo is coming from. Um, I was safety director in Columbus, Ohio, so I had the opportunity to oversee a force of around 1,800 police officers. I have had the opportunity to prosecute uh, police officers, investigate attorney, um, internal affairs on police officers. Uh, I am currently general counsel to the Columbus Urban League. I, my past life, I was general counsel for the NAACP. I'm gonna give an overview of what I think current policing issues um, that I think the public doesn't get a good handle on. And these are the things that the whole debate between police officers, union, uh, authority, qualified immunity, and other related issues. Um, police officers and unions do not hire, they do not train, they do not discipline officers, they do not promote uh, within the ranks of officers. They do not set the budget. They do not set priorities for the department. Um, they do not select the equipment. They do not set the criteria for hiring officers. If a department wants to require that all officers have an associate's degree, they simply have to 
institute that. That's not a term that's negotiated with the union. The uh, management has the absolute right to do that. Um, the issue we've seen with the riots is what type of equipment do police officers use, such as the rubber bullets. That's been an issue that's gone back and forth. Uh, law enforcement officers who show up for riot patrol or other patrol do not determine what equipment they have to use. So if uh, management wants to say that it's inappropriate to use rubber bullets, they simply do not equip them with that. If they want to take away paper, pepper spray, I think that would be incredibly stupid, but they could do that. And we're having all these debates. So from the public standpoint, how do we judge a department or officer or an officer's performance? As I just went through what officers don't have the authority to do. Tasers, when we look at the situation that just happened in Philadelphia, when the two officers showed up, I think Philadelphia has around 4,600 officers. Um, 2,600 officers are equipped with tasers. So the ability to use a certain equipment in that situation, it was, it was um, an honest discussion when the family and the lawyer for the families came out and said, look, uh, these officers did what they were trained to do in the way they needed to do it. Uh, that shooting with the individual who had the knife could not be uh, avoided. When we look at the situation that occurred with George Floyd, a lot of people ask the question, how could that officer be so calm uh, as he uh, had his knee on George Floyd's neck? The reason is um, that technique had been on the book in that municipality for over 12 years. The officer that um, did that technique was one of the supervisors and the trainers of that technique. So you ask yourself, why was that being done? Because that was on the books, that's the way the officer, officer was training and that's what, what, what was acceptable. Again, when we look at the overall art of policing, I can go back to my safety director days. And I remember early on the force, we had a situation where there was an abuse by one particular officer in the use of mace. Uh, and I asked the question of uh, the, the command staff is what's going on here? This officer says, hello, and he uses mace. And they told me it was not a use of force. I said, we're gonna declare it a use of force. So what we did is three incidents within a certain period of time, took that person back into in-service training. And we begin to deal with those situations. The idea of the relationship between the community particularly the minority community has always been a touchy subject. I think as Heather just went over. One of the circumstances we had in the zip code that was primarily black, uh, where uh, senior citizen children could not go out and play in their neighborhood. I asked our officers, I said, look, what do we need to do? And they said, director, we don't think it's a good idea. We're not invited. We don't want, they don't want us in that neighborhood. I said, okay, then what do we need to do to make it comfortable for you to be in that neighborhood? We, needed, we need to be invited in. So I went to the uh, Nation of Islam at the time, Brother Donnell Mohammed, and I said, uh, brother, we need to have a press conference and we need to invite the officers in. And we need to go through a debugging period of having those officers on bikes and walking the streets and getting to know the community. And that is exactly what we did. We wanted to have diversity within those ranks, so we had to make some shifts. Another thing we did was in the university area, Ohio State, we were having an uptick in crime, and I called one of the command staffers in and I said, okay, can we institute a bike control, bike patrol? And he said, absolutely, director, how soon do you wanna do that? I said, I'd like to do it in three months. He said, we can do it in a month. So I think the creative idea between management and how it responds to its officers with the equipment that it needs. And if you do these with police officers, you tell them what the rules are, enforce them fairly, enforce them consistently, I think you'll begin to eradicate some of those problems. In Columbus, Ohio, uh, you may have seen on CNN this past week that we have a number of black officers who are talking about racism within the department. So for 16 years before the current mayor, uh, the mayor of Columbus, Ohio was African-American. We've had four African-American safety directors. 
in that time period when I was there, when we'd have those kind of issues, we would call the command staff in, we'd sit, we had addressed those issues, whether it was alleged gender discrimination and or race discrimination. So it's a problem that I think we can handle. I think the issue, as we saw in Atlanta, that a mayor has to make a decision whether he or she's gonna take action immediately or they're gonna have their city burned down and riots in the streets. Um, I'm happy I'm not in that position, uh, but if you haven't done your goodwill ahead of time and you have one of these situations, if, you, if you've seen in Louisville and Milwaukee and Minneapolis, on and on, then you're gonna have this kind of outbreak and you're gonna have officers uh, indicted uh, to, to, to try to keep the city from burning down, uh, but you're not going to get to the real core of the problems. Um, one of the things we do um, with the FOP is we spend probably uh, about a half million dollars training our lawyers, training our officers around the country, and we talk about best practices. And we talk about bridging that racial divide between the Black clergy and particularly the Black community and our officers. And we're having some successes. We're having a lot of successes until things exploded. Um, so that's kind of my overview and my experience. Um, officers struggle if they've been in a certain area for X number of uh, years on the same beat. Uh, so we need to give them relief. Can we rotate them out? Um, this is an er ever evolving area um, that everyone needs to uh, participate listen and try to make the system better. And with that, I'll call on uh, Robert McNamara. All right, thank you very much, Mr. James. And thanks for to the Federalist Society for the invitation to, to speak today. And I, I think a lot of the debates about modern law enforcement and difficulties with law enforcement uh, take place in the shadow of the debate over qualified immunity. And I think that makes sense. Uh, qualified immunity certainly has a lot to do with law enforcement. Uh, but I also think it's important to recognize that qualified immunity is about a lot more than law enforcement. Qualified immunity, of course, is the doctrine that says a, a government official cannot be held liable for violating the Constitution unless the right they violated was what's called clearly established, which in practice frequently means that a plaintiff has to be able to point to a particular appellate decision in that jurisdiction in which exactly the same conduct and exactly the same circumstances was held to be unconstitutional. Uh, and that's not a doctrine about law enforcement, that's a doctrine about government. It's a doctrine about government misconduct and how courts should react to government misconduct. And it's a doctrine that covers all government employees from IRS agents to code enforcement inspectors to social workers who may decide to destroy your property or strip search your children for reasons of their own. Uh, and I think it's important to recognize Really, what we're talking about when we talk about qualified immunity is not police misconduct, but government misconduct more broadly, and the question of how we're going to respond to official misconduct. And I think as a response to official misconduct, qualified immunity has a, a lot of blame to be laid at its feet. Qualified immunity is a failure. It's a failure as a matter of law. It's a failure as a matter of policy. And it's a failure as just a matter of basic human morality. Uh, qualified immunity fails as a matter of law because it has no foundation in the law. Uh, modern qualified immunity, this idea that a right has to be clearly established as measured by existing published federal precedent, uh, is not a common law doctrine. It is not incorporated into the text of Section 1983. It was invented by the Supreme Court about 40 years ago. Uh, and so it's a judge-made doctrine, not a common law doctrine of longstanding. And as a judge-made doctrine, I think it can only be defended on grounds of policy. And I think on grounds of policy, it falls massively short. Um, as an initial matter, one of the huge problems with qualified immunity is that it rests on this, this kind of strange legal fiction, right? Which says government officials are keeping careful track of the published federal opinions in their jurisdiction. So that when the Fourth Circuit hands down an opinion, everyone who is within the Fourth Circuit scrupulously reads the factual details of that case and conforms their behavior to it. And I think we all know that's not true uh, with, with all respect to the judge. Uh, government employees are not scrupulously reading everything the federal appellate courts put out. And so I think what qualified immunity does is it makes liability arbitrary. 
where an official's liability no longer depends on how egregious his behavior was or whether he was violating department policies. It depends on whether a particular federal opinion came out one week before or one week after he engaged in his misconduct, even though we all acknowledge that he didn't read that opinion and wasn't expected to read that opinion. So it makes liability arbitrary, which is the opposite of what we should want if we want to deter serious misconduct. Your liability should depend on how serious your misconduct was, not on this sort of gotcha game of combing through the federal precedents. Uh, so I think it creates bad incentives for police and government behavior. And I think it fails to achieve the things it's actually meant to achieve. Uh, the, the two arguments put forth in favor of qualified immunity are that we want to protect government officials from engaging in needless litigation. And we want to protect government officials who are put in difficult positions to make split second decisions. And I don't think either of those really holds up to scrutiny. Uh, Joanna Schwartz, who is the, the leading scholar on this area out at UCLA, has pretty clearly established that qualified immunity doesn't lead to less litigation. It leads to more litigation in a lot of cases because qualified immunity means that the government official defendant gets a, an automatic right of appeal when his motion to dismiss is denied, an automatic right of appeal when his motion for summary judgment is denied, and then, like the rest of us, has a right of appeal after trial. And it duplicates litigation needlessly without necessarily eliminating weaker cases rather than stronger cases. And while I certainly have sympathy with the notion that government officials uh, have to make sometimes split second decisions, I think using qualified immunity to police that is exactly backwards. Our concern for split second decisions is already baked into the underlying substantive test. The Fourth Amendment protects us from unreasonable searches, unreasonable seizures. And I think when we're talking about whether someone had only a second to make their decision, that certainly goes into whether it was reasonable but the qualified immunity analysis doesn't take into account whether someone had eight hours to make their decision or eight weeks to make their decision. It hinges on whether there's a prior federal opinion saying exactly this conduct and exactly this context violates the Constitution. Uh, and so I think to the extent we're worried about um, too much liability, qualified immunity doesn't actually reduce the liability and the right place to focus is on the reasonableness standard, is on the underlying substantive constitutional standard, which leads me to the third and I think the fatal problem with qualified immunity, which is that it totally divorces us from the constitutional standard. I, I think it's good and it's healthy to have debates about what the Fourth Amendment allows and doesn't allow. I think it's good and healthy to have debates about what's excessive force and what's not. That's what the Constitution calls upon us to do. What qualified immunity calls upon us to do is to look at an instance of government misconduct, admit that it violates the Constitution, and then do nothing about it. And I think people of good faith on the right and the left rightly rebel at that command. We should be deciding whether conduct was right or wrong. We shouldn't uh, be admitting it was wrong and saying that's okay anyway. But that's the command of qualified immunity. That's the perversity of qualified immunity. And I think that's the heart of at least my problem with the doctrine. Uh, and I think the doctrine, by making liability so arbitrary, uh, leads us to have bad incentives. Uh, there are three possible people who could bear the costs of, uh, of government misconduct. We could put the costs on the government official themselves, which in many cases might be unjust and crushing. We could put the costs on a department, on an insurance company, which in practice is the entity that actually pays these judgments. That's in a position to say, Maybe we have bad use of force policies. Maybe we're not doing a good job of hiring and firing. Maybe management is making mistakes and put the incentive there. All too often, what the current system of qualified immunity does is look at a violation, admit that it's a violation of the Constitution, and say all of those costs should be paid by the victim, the person who did nothing wrong, who had no opportunity to change department policy uh, or to to take any steps to avoid that situation. That I think is intolerable and that I think is why you see voices on the left and on the right unifying around the idea that something has gone seriously awry with the court's modern qualified immunity doctrine. Uh, with that, I will cede the floor to Mr. Sim Mr. Stimson. Well, thanks, Bob. I very much appreciate uh, your comments and uh, it's an honor to uh, be part of this panel and with the 
distinguished judge, uh, moderating, and I, like him, uh, used to lurk in the halls of the Mayflower and look up at the panelists and enjoy things, uh, and drink in the intellectual debate, and it's an honor to be on this side of the dais. And like him also, I was a federal prosecutor, but I was also a state and local prosecutor and, ha and handled homicides. And so Heather's remarks really ring true to me because I was a prosecutor in D.C., and in D.C., most of the homicides were committed uh, by African Americans against African Americans, and that is a true reality. Uh, I'm going to focus my remarks on qualified immunity as it relates to police officers, uh, recognizing, as Bob said, that qualified immunity applies to uh, thousands and thousands of government uh, officials. And at the outset, let me just say that I want to make clear that in no way, shape, or form am I going to defend the actions of the police officer who killed George Floyd or who shot and killed other unarmed people or the officer who sicked uh, dogs on suspects who had surrendered and had their hands up, uh, or officers who stole $225,000 in cash and rare coins from people, or the officer in Latt uh, Latt Lattice versus Phillips who ran a suspect off the road with his car and then shot and killed him, or other studies that Clark Neely and Bob and others could, could uh, cite uh, all day long. And at the same time, as much as I respect the, the work of IJ, I really do admire their work and follow their work and Cato and others, uh, I respectfully disagree with their push uh, to absolutely abolish uh, qualified immunity. To my mind, uh, qualified immunity is not an unlawful shield, uh, nor is it a blank check uh, for government uh, overreach. And to that end, I wanna focus on three main points in my opening remarks. One, that even though section 1983 does not per se mention qualified immunity, uh, or immunity at all, there is substantial evidence that the 19th century common law did recognize a freestanding qualified immunity protecting all government officers, discretionary duties like qualified immunity today. Second, that as a practical matter, abolishing qualified immunity in toto would indeed result in a tsunami of lawsuits against police officers, most of whom did not violate the constitutional rights of anyone. Uh, in other words, to root out the few bad apples in the 750,000 plus police officers we have in this country, you put a bullseye on all of them. Uh, and third, like it or not, the Supreme Court has upheld qualified immunity tons of times um, with slight modifications and lower courts have upheld and applied it thousands and thousands of times. Uh, and as conservatives, we should be wary of upending the reliance interests at stake uh, and overturning precedent just because we don't like the outcome in a certain number of cases. So let me expand on my first point. Judge Stone, who I think is a member of the Federal Society and uh, was is the Assistant uh, Solicitor General in Texas, argued this September in another FedSoc event against Clark Neely about qualified immunity. And I was persuaded uh, by his argument uh, when he said that there's a certain appeal uh, that since Section 1983 does not mention qualified immunity. As textualists, we should sort of be very wary of any court-created uh, qualified immunity from Section 1983. Um, but also, Judd pointed out uh, that Congress passes law against the backdrop of common law principles, including common law defenses. Uh, and as some of you are uh, certainly aware, um, uh, Scott Keller has recently published or, uh, penned a law review article in Stanford Law Review, which is coming out next year, uh, outlining uh, the common law uh, uh, background here. And so as sympathetic as I am to Bob's textualist argument, I find myself more convinced after listening to Judd's arguments and reading Professor Aaron Nelson, Nielsen and Chris Walker's scholarship and Scott Keller's work uh, that that there was a pervasive immunity defense of common law for government officials that informs Section 1983 and judges today. Scott argues, quote, that the legitimacy of state officer immunities under the court's precedence depends on the common law as it existed when Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1871. In the Supreme Court's own words, it cannot make a freestanding policy choice and must apply immunities Congress implicitly adopted from the common law tradition, unquote. And Scott reviewed the four leading 19th century tort treatises that the court consults when assessing officer immunity common law. Cooley's 1879 Law of Torts, Bishop's 1889 Commentaries on Non-Contract Law, Meacham's 1890 Law of Public Offices and Officers, and Throop's 
1892 law relating to public officers. And he traces scores of state court decisions uh, applying those principles. And Bob may say, like Clark said in the previous debate, well, that's, that's persuasive, but it's post hoc rationalization uh, for arguing to keep qualified immunity. Fine, but that doesn't address the very real fact that Scott has contributed uh, in a very new way, in real way, to the debate by pointing out that the common law does indeed, and did indeed, uh, recognize a freestanding qualified immunity doctrine that protected all government officers' uh, discretionary duties. Now, now look, at common law, they didn't, uh, as Scott point out, look to clearly establish law. That's a made-up term, and I see Bob nodding his head. Uh, but look at an officer's subjective and proper purpose. And the plaintiff then had the burden to prove improper purpose with clear evidence. So we can debate, and I hope we do, the extent to which the courts should take into amount, account these common law realities when interpreting section 1983, or whether the court should revisit the clearly established standard and revert back to the common law standard uh, and allocation of the burden of proof, which is a bone of contention. Um, now, there may be hope on that front. In addition to Justice Thomas and Sotomayor, Justice Neil Gorsuch, uh, maybe another sympathetic year on the court for relaxing the level of specificity needed uh, for a violation to be clearly established as demonstrated by a dissent he wrote uh, while he was on the 10th circuit in a case called AM versus Holmes. Furthermore, other circuit court judges, including uh, Don Willett, are calling for a reevaluation of qualified immunity too, especially the current application of the clearly established standard. Uh, but to my mind, uh, it is a more reasonable way forward by looking at the common law uh, and what was provided uh, to recognize that there was a clearly established uh, principle at, at hand. Second point, and these are shorter. If qualified immunity is abolished for all police officers, the number of lawsuits, with all due respect to Professor Schwartz, against police officers will inevitably go up more than it is today. I can tell you from a personal perspective as a prosecutor working at the local, state, and federal level and a defense attorney and a judge for five years, that the vast majority of complaints against police officers I've seen lack merit. Um, most of the conduct complained about falls into the four corners of their official duties. Some of it comes close to the line, an infinitesimal, uh, an infinitesimal amount of it uh, crosses the line, and some of that violates a person's constitutional rights. So if you eliminate qualified immunity for all officers, you will guarantee a flood of meritless allegations against officers. Uh, and think about it from the cop's perspective. Do you want to put your life on the line and try to do your very best uh, and then before and make split spec second decisions as Larry talked about uh, and then be held personally liable because some attorney convinces a judge uh, that your actions somehow violate his constitutional rights? I don't think so. And how far does that abolition train go? Uh, would military personnel, I've served in the Navy for 27 years, while training for an overseas deployment, trying to mimic a real combat environment, be personally liable if they injure or kill civilians during a live fire exercise or bombing exercise? Do we want judges, with all due respect to Judge Budeme, uh, to put themselves in the place of a gunner's mate or a SEAL and lay down a four-part test about what a reasonable SEAL should have done under those circumstances? I really don't think so. My last point, the Supreme Court has upheld a qualified immunity dozens of times. Uh, lower courts have applied that uh, and Scott Keller's scholarship establishes quite clearly there was a robust common law recognition of freestanding qualified immunity. So I think we need to be thoughtful about whether we're asking the court to throw out or amend it. And I think there's a few ways you can amend it. You could treat uh, it as a defense of liability rather than an immunity to suit. Uh, you could incentivize indemnification. Uh, you could reform police unions. And I'll be curious to hear if Larry thinks that there are some reforms that might be useful. Uh, and you could reform the attorney fee, she shift, fee shifting, uh, but Congress could get involved too, and state uh, legislatures can get involved like California has. So with those uh, initial remarks, I'll turn it back over uh, to the judge. Your Honor. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for those uh, insightful comments. Heather, I wanted to start with you. Um, if you can unmute your uh, button. Can you, can you hear me? Okay, well, I'll, Heather, while you... I'm curious, uh, your, your response to Heather's comments that, um, that police are... I'm, 
Um, oh, Heather, are you there? No, yeah. Uh -huh. I okay, have sorry. Okay, sorry. Got it. Uh, so I wanted to, to see if you have any response to Larry's comments. It seems to me that both of you agree that uh, distrust of, of police in the community is, uh, is a problem. He, he thinks some of the solutions might be increasing diversity in the ranks and changing some of the use of force uh, laws, rules. Uh, what is your response to that? Well, I don't think it's a, a, a full picture. Of course, there is some distrust among some portions of the community of the police. Uh, but let me give you another voice. I'm sorry, you know, I, I, I hate to be working with anecdotes here, but this is a voice that is purely representative. A woman who got up in the 41st precinct of the South Bronx in the middle of a community meeting and apropos of nothing, uh, said how lovely when we see the police, they are my friends. Um, um, I spoke to Mrs. Sweeper, an elderly cancer amputee in the Mount Hope section of the Bronx who said, please Jesus, send more police because the only time she felt safe to go into her business, into her building lobby and get her mail was when the cops were there because it was otherwise colonized by trespassing youth, hanging out, smoking weed and selling drugs. Those are the voices that never get represented in the mainstream media. I, I don't know a cop who is not going out of his way to try to reach out. Some get very hardened. Uh, that is a bad thing that needs to be worked on constantly. Let us also acknowledge the reason why cops develop officious attitudes sometimes, things like airmail, uh, which is bags of feces and urine thrown at them from the roofs of housing projects. These are realities that simply never enter mainstream discourse. Uh, you know, it's, it's very fashionable and, and always a safe harbor to say we need more community policing. I'm not, and I'm not accusing Mr. James of having said that, but that's a, a general response. Community policing is an absolutely vapid term at this point. Again, there's not a, a department in the country that isn't going to say that it's doing community policing. Uh, it has no meaning. Uh, so, yes, I, I just, I, I, in my experience, police are trying to reach out. Let us acknowledge the other side of the equation, the uh, stigma against snitching. The cops will tell you that uh, they could solve every single shooting and every single homicide if the numerous witnesses to those crime scenes actually came forward with what they know, including the victims of shootings. Uh, the problem that I see is this national narrative that says that the problem in this country is racist policing when the evidence that is being proffered for that racism is almost invariably disparate impact and the fact that the cops cannot respond to those thousands of good, decent, hardworking people who beg for more proactive enforcement without, as I say, generating the racially disproportionate data that can be used to shut them down. Thank you. Uh, Larry, do you have any response to Heather? Do you want to unmute your button? I want to come at it from a different perspective because obviously as general counsel of the national FOP, I'm not going to disagree with that narrative. But I think there is a more concrete, objective way of coming at this. When I was safety director, one of the things I knew if I wanted to address an issue, I went to the command staff. The command staff is that in between the upper a hierarchy of a police department and the officers who are put on the street. And I talked a little bit about that. And these officers understood what you needed to train. They understood what you needed by the way of equipment. They understood how to interact with uh, the community, how to have those uh, relationships to establish them, to build that trust. So whatever our opinions are or are not, we are at a crossroads and it's difficult. So what I wanna do is I wanna put it back in those officers' um, 
uh, domain where they're making the decisions, they're having input into the training. I mean, the two things I talked about, for instance, in Philadelphia, we all saw the clip. Police officers are called, the individual has a knife. They do everything by the book, they're backing up. They're, they don't have a taser. So the budgetary process, what I'm trying to say is to the public, when you're looking at these issues and something's gone wry, and even with the George Floyd situation, because that criminal trial will take place for those four officers, the outcome is far from uh, uh, assured. But that officer, he was trained a certain way to implement a technique, and I'm not defending it. That is what they had on the books. That's what they trained. So what we say on behalf of the national FOP, when we're talking about citizen review board, when we're talking about uh, use of force, when we're talking about any aspect of curtailing police activity and the equipment of what you're gonna have to use when you're riding, go to the officers, let them on the basis of their training, their experience. Heather is absolutely right. And I talked about that situation in the black community when we sent the officers out to take back those neighborhoods. But I can assure you with that narrative is not gonna carry today and it's not gonna win the day, it will further divide us. So we stay away from that narrative because that becomes a part of that blame game. We can't blame the cops and we can't blame the poor black communities or poor communities as a whole. Thank you. Uh, Robert, I wanted to ask you a question uh, about qualified immunity. Um, you, you suggested one uh, avenue for a replacement would be that uh, the liability would fall on insurance companies. My question would be, what, what would change on the ground then for the, the cop on the street if they know that they're not personally liable and it will go to the insurance company anyway? How will that change uh, officer actions on the street? Well, I think a lot of the hope for changing officer action on the street uh, is not the, the interim effect of them losing their, their home and being driven into bankruptcy. A lot of what we're hoping uh, to achieve through liability is change structural behavior, where an insurance company that wants to avoid liability has every incentive to say, hey, this guy has had a lot of disciplinary complaints. Are you sure he should be out on the street? Or We've identified among all the jurisdictions we ensure that this particular use of force policy or this particular de-escalation training really helps and will lower your premiums if you implement this use of force policy that we think reduces these violations. I think the hope in reducing or eliminating qualified immunity isn't a flood of lawsuits and isn't actually more liability. It's trying to reduce on the front end the number of incidents that give rise to liability in the first place. And that's why, I mean, I think Cully and I completely agree on the importance of indemnification and at common law, sheriffs were indemnified by a surety for, for mistakes they made in the course of carrying out their duties. Thank you. So it's almost time for audience questions. Uh, just as a reminder, we will only be taking questions via Zoom. If you are a video participant, you can get in line uh, to ask a question by clicking the raise your hand button. If you are calling in, you could dial star nine. I'll call on you uh, once it's your turn to ask questions. Um, and before we get to the audience, uh, Kali, I'll get last question to you. It seems like you both agree that we should return to the common law defenses, but wouldn't that be more difficult for the cop on the street then? It, it seems like at least the clearly established uh, law standard or test that allows for clear rules and clear uh, notice of what an officer can do. Wouldn't the common law approach make it more difficult uh, for the officer to act, especially in the split second decision uh, area? It might as a legal matter at first blush, Your Honor, but I think over time, I mean, I think there's a, uh, uh, a level of professionalism and training that Heather talked to, and I've trained the officers to, and I'm sure Larry has as well, uh, that uh, sets a floor, not a ceiling on officer behavior. And the courts are more than adequately situated, uh, you know, when you were a prosecutor, uh, that you know when a, a police officer crosses the line, not operating within the four corners of her duties and executes a warrant that did, they did, she didn't know was invalid in one particular factual matter. But you'll, you, I think over time that'll sort itself out. I, I'd be curious to hear 
uh, what Larry thinks, uh, because it seemed to me that he was suggesting that police unions and collective bargaining agreements don't cover uh, uh, a lot of the things that I and others, I think, think they should cover. For example, is it not true that some police bargaining agreements protect errant cops and it makes it harder for them to be fired? Uh, whereas if you could adjust some of those rules, it would allow those police officers uh, to be fired because I think a lot of people in the force know who the, the few bad apples are. That's another way. I don't think the insurance route uh, is a good route as a former insurance executive because then you're actually giving the green light for officers to do more misconduct because they're going to think uh, the Chubb or some insurance company is going to pay for it. Larry, do you have any thoughts? Yes, a uh, couple things, um, if I could piggyback. Uh, since 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court has actually decided five qualified immunity cases. The decisions were handed down 9-0 and 8-1. Um, on the issue of qualified immunity, where qualified immunity is denied and those matters actually go to trial, officers are winning those cases at a rate of 85%. So the question is, what would the elimination of qualified immunity uh, do? Um, we have certain townships uh, around the country, small, that will uh, do consortium and they will have insurance policies that defend. Um, and they're a lot more stringent in their defense of those cases uh, than probably the government, the municipalities are. The other thing that wasn't talked about on the issue of qualified immunity, and I have two of those cases I'm representing uh, officers now, Judge, you've seen them, where the municipality or government entity has cut the officer loose. In other words, they're not offering him any ind ind uh, indemnification, uh, no duty to defend, and that individual is naked. So you're seeing, I think, a self-censorship uh, with government now where those individuals are cut loose. The other thing I would say that on the qualified immunity side of it, when those officers in Philadelphia were facing that individual with a knife, they weren't thinking about qualified immunity. When that officer was had his neck on George Floyd, he was not thinking about qualified immunity. There is not going to be a chilling effect on the behavior of officers. So I think that's just a mis mistaken belief. Um, we, we've seen certain uh, initiatives, I think in Colorado, they've eliminated uh, qualified immunity, but they capped the officer's liability at $25,000. And the last real world reality is, if you get a judgment against an officer, he or she's gonna declare bankruptcy. Thank you. And so we'll turn to, uh audience questions and answers. But before uh, I get to that, I want to give everyone the CLE password. Uh, so have your pen ready. The, the CLE password is I'll read it again in, in, the, in the future if you missed it, but right now it's So we'll turn to our first audience uh, question. I just wanted to make a reminder that uh, your, your question should actually be a question and not a statement and uh, should be brief. Uh, our first participant will be Michael Rosman. Uh, uh, please unmute your microphone and go ahead and ask your question. Okay, can you hear me, Judge? Yes, you, yes I can, go ahead. This has been a great panel. I compliment all of you on uh, your presentations and the discussion so far. I have a question for Mr. McNamara. Um, so we were, we were, you know, we're talking about police a lot, but their qualified immunity, as we've all acknowledged, applies in a lot of different areas. And there are some difficult legal areas. You can think about the First Amendment, a public employer, you know, trying to restrict the speech of an employee. Um, procedural due process. Uh, is there a liberty interest? Is there a property interest? You're entitled to some kind of hearing. Is it before? Is it after? Uh, I'm not that familiar with right to counsel, but I have uh, some understanding that it has something to do with being in custody, and that's whether or not the person being interrogated feels free to leave, which can be a difficult thing to do. So my question is, in, in these instances, is it 
do you really would would you really want an individual officer, uh, uh, employer, college administrator to be personally liable in case they make a bad legal decision? I mean, I think. It- in, in all honesty, my first instinct is that the way we usually deal with legal questions is we ask courts to resolve legal questions. Uh, and the question is why in this particular context, we would want to put a thumb on the scale in favor of the defendant. Uh, we don't put a thumb on the scale when I'm deciding whether or not to cut down my neighbor's tree. If I cut down the tree and it's on my neighbor's property and a court decides that, then I'm on the hook. And I'm not sure as a matter of policy, which is all we're talking about in this context, we want to put a thumb on the scale in favor of the university administrator who's deciding whether or not student speech he doesn't like. Uh, That I think if we respect our constitutional rights and we respect that public university students right to speak, uh, we don't want a special halo uh, protecting the people who are trying to silence him. Uh, I think the The Constitution means what it says, and for us to have meaningful constitutional rights, those rights should be enforceable when they're violated. Thank you, Anne. We'll go to the next caller. But uh, once again, the CLE password is Uh, The next participant is Rashida McMurray Abdullah. Uh, Please uh, remember to uh, unmute your phone and go ahead and ask your question. Honor, you can hear me clearly? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Yes, I, this has been a fascinating discussion, particularly with the qualified immunity. And so I missed the very first part where all of the different panelists introduced their names. And so my question is really about the qualified immunity. I know there's been a lot of conversation about um, perhaps an alternative would to be have insurance companies as a, as, um, a funder of these types of suits. But hasn't historically the the problem have been is that the municipalities end up having, because they are self-insured, end up carrying the weight of some of these big cases, like particularly like in Louisville, I think it was a pretty um, sizable settlement that the municipality had to cover on behalf of the of the the incident that happened to Breonna Taylor, and they subsequently did fire the officer. But all of those resources that are going to that Louisville community, instead of having to pay, pay for um, the paying the suit for you know wrongful, I, I don't know exactly the nature of what the settlement was, you know, what the details for the settlement. But that's money that's coming out of those communities that could be put better in for mental health. It could be for training. Um, education for students, you know, police athletic league. So how do we reconcile in just saying that we're just not concerned about the officer in terms of having that liability, but now it's falling on the victims, which is the city and the citizens of that community. Thank you. Uh, Kali, do you wanna take that or? I think Robert's probably better suited to, to tackle that one, Robert, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I certainly understand the, the concerns for the public fisc, but again, I, I think the hope in putting liability on the, the municipality that has the power to set policies in the first place is that that creates a disincentive to allow unconstitutional things to happen in the first place. Uh, I, I think it's Mr. James is absolutely right that a, a judgment against a, an individual police officer is going to result in that officer's bankruptcy. Uh, and that officer frequently is not in a position to have changed the policies, changed the training program uh, in advance. What we want is to create a system where there are fewer people whose constitutional rights are being violated. And it seems to me that the best way to do that is to lay the costs of constitutional violations at the feet of the people who have the most power to implement better policies, better hiring and firing, better training programs. And that is generally going to be the, the governmental entity itself. Yes, and I, if I could uh, echo on that, I mean, that's why I started out on my narrative of all the things that police officers do not do. And um, I think there was an earlier question whether the unions and police protect bad cops. Uh, And I think every uh, police officer will tell you they do not wanna work with a bad cop. On the arbitration situation, um, the lawyers for the union 
uh, and the union makes the decision whether they're going to take a matter to arbitration, less than 5% of the cases, discipline police cases, go to final arbitration where there's a decision. And the reason for that small number is that the, when you're evaluating it from the union standpoint, you don't want a bad precedent that you're gonna take forward. So the union says, we're not gonna grieve that. We're not gonna take that forward. And then when you look at the numbers that actually go to the uh, final arbitration, 52% of those uh, arbitrations are rejected by arbitrators. So this idea that there's a groundswell of bad police officers being handled is just not the case. I think during the time period when I was safety director, I ended up firing three police officers and those cases did not go to arbitration. Uh, there were a couple other cases on civil liability where we actually took, actually let one officer go on his own. We just weren't gonna defend him. But I think in this, uh, this environment, what you're seeing around the country, they're firing officers, they're indicting officers, and you see when it's not warranted, those officers are being reinstated, and then they're settling with the officer for them not to come back. So we've got to deal with the real issue about what is the government entity actually training. So if we have these riot situations where the officers are given these rubber bullets and they're shot in the head, take them away. These are government practices, not individual officers practice who are making decisions. They're using the tools they're given or not given. Thank you. Heather, I, I was curious what your thoughts are on police unions. Do you think that uh, reform of police unions is part uh, of the solution or they're not a problem at all? If you can unmute, sorry, Heather. still on mute. <laughs> okay, I'll come back to you. Uh, if you could, oh, there you are. There you go. Go ahead. It doesn't show. I think it's hard to generalize. I, I respect a, a lot of police chiefs who say that they have had unduly difficult times getting rid of, of um, bad officers. Some unions are more obstreperous. Uh, have more power than others. I actually don't think the unions in the New York Police Department are uh, particularly uh, uh, averse to any sort of necessary reforms. So, yes, I, you know, one can debate things like the 72 hour rule. I, I, in my experience, a lot of the procedures that become the obvious targets for criticism have a colorable justification for them. These are difficult issues uh, with regard. I'm for releasing video camera, uh, body cam video as soon as possible. I'm for transparency. Nevertheless, uh, there are certain balancing decisions that police administrators have to make. Uh, and you know, the easy position is to bash unions. And, and frankly, a lot of cops can be an utter pain in the butt. Uh, they're, they, as a profession, they tend to be whiners. I've, I've rarely found a cop who likes his commissioner, even though that's justified. On the other hand, uh, let's acknowledge the reality of the reason that they develop a often counterproductive bunker mentality is because they feel rightly so, that they are facing a world that has no comprehension of what they are doing on a daily basis, that turns its eyes away from the cultural breakdown that is heart-wrenching, that is creating these insane drive-by shootings, these 15-year-olds who feel no compunction about simply opening fire at a sidewalk because they see an uh, a, a enemy gang member and in the process are shooting one-year-olds in their backyards. The cops are dealing with that and they're being called racists for going where the crime is. 
And, and that sort of abyss between cops reality and the way the public discourse that talks about crime and policing in this country does lead to a obstinacy that can end up being counterproductive. So uh, rather than seeking again, another safe harbor of, well, let's all talk about uh, obstreperous unions. My position here is let us be honest. The problem in this country is not the police, it's crime. Policing is an epiphenomenon of crime in this country. And unless we bring the black crime rate down, uh, we are never going to get out of this discourse unless we're more honest with ourselves. Thanks. Uh, Kali, you wanted to jump in? If I could just add to Heather's point, which I agree with 100%, is there's another uh, very disturbing trend that's happening right now, and that is the uh, advent of these so-called progressive prosecutors, what we've called rogue prosecutors at Heritage, and we've written a major paper on that. Uh, and you have people uh, like Rachel Rollins in Boston and Larry Krasner in Philadelphia and Mary Mosby in Baltimore and Kim Fox in Chicago, and now George Gascon yeah. won uh, the seat in LA. He unseated the first black African-American female uh, elected DA who was a progressive but a, a person who actually was a traditional independent prosecutor and they're beholden to the Soros type movement uh, and their non-prosecution policies. And so you have, for example, in Boston, Your Honor, uh, a DA who, when she was elected, issues 15 crimes you can commit in Boston. It's called the P Rollins Policy Memo, including assault on a police officer, including breaking and entering, including quid, possession with intent to distribute and a lot of other crimes. And imagine the impact that has on police officers who are dealing with those crimes happening in front of their face, knowing that the DA's office, the gatekeeper to the criminal justice system, uh, is not even gonna prosecute that and they gleefully talk about that. And so, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not for bad cops. Don't get me the wrong way. I think what that cop did to George Floyd is despicable. And I think that the criminal justice system is adequately posed, poised to prosecute bad cops and they should. Uh, but when you compound the problem with what Heather's talking about with the rogue prosecutor movement, you have a toxic mix and it's affecting morale, it's affecting recruitment, it's affecting retention, um, and it's affecting crime rates in those cities where the rogue prosecutors are being elected. Thank you. Uh, Walter Clapp, uh, you're up next. Uh, please remember to unmute your uh, Zoom uh, link and go ahead and ask your question. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, everyone. My question, well, I'll, I'll start with two brief statements and then the question. I'm quoting John McWhorter on a podcast with Sam Harris. You know, 60% of the underlying problem in the urban black community could be solved by ending the war on drugs. And talking about the underlying problems uh, facing police in that bunker mentality that you talked about, Heather, certainly comes from living in a war zone. Today, a rich white kid can go and get prescribed dextroamphetamine from a doctor with a prescription, and the poor white kids are going and getting hooked on meth. My question is this, is one of the modern, one of the modern quandaries of law enforcement the relic of the war on drugs that exists today? Well, I can take that. Am I muted or unmuted? You're good to go, Heather. Okay. I, I thought you were going to be saying 60% of the problems uh, in the urban community, and I was, was said 100% are through the family breakdown. That's really the, if you want a root cause, that's what, what we're seeing here. Males, young males are not being civilized because they are not in a marriage culture any longer. The war on drugs, you can read Michael Fortner, uh, you can read uh, others at, at Yale Law School was, was initiated by the black community, whether it's the Rockefeller drug laws or the uh, crack and powder cocaine disparity that was initiated by the Congressional Black Caucus. The people who live with open air drug markets are living under the pall of fear 
they understand that oppression. They also understand the oppression of drug addiction. Again, it was, it was black newspapers in the 1950s in Harlem and black politicians in Harlem that were calling for, they wanted to, they wanted to jail drug users, addicts. Uh, you can read some of the language in Michael Fortner's book. It's, it's astounding. Uh, and today, uh, you know, what, if you pull back what we saw after the Freddie Gray riots in, um, in Baltimore, the cops virtually stopped any type of drug enforcement rather than this leading to a halcyon period of peace. Uh, shootings went through the roof. There was a direct inverse correlation between the amount of drug enforcement going on uh, and the amount of street violence that was going on. A, for once, very rarely, the Baltimore Sun and the Washington Post actually sent reporters to police community meetings in West Baltimore. And for once, those reporters reported the types of things that you hear from those law-abiding residents. And there was a copy store owner who said, since you've stopped enforcing the law, it's like a drug dealer's convention here. He, he was losing business. Nobody wanted to come to his copy shop, copy store, uh, because they were so terrified of what's going on. Uh, so at, at the, the, the reality is, is that the reason the cops are in those neighborhoods enforcing drug laws is because that's where people are complaining about open air drug markets. They're not complaining in Amherst. Uh, there may be some universal inequity about that, but right now the cops are dealing with what the complaints are that they're getting, and that is to want more enforcement, not less. Thanks, Heather. Uh, Paula Unrau, uh, you are up next. Please remember to unmute your uh, button and go ahead and ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Excellent, thank you. And thank you so much for taking my question. Um, just for some perspective, um, I'm, I am a 34 year insurance pro a professional and a paralegal, but I'm actually here as a concerned white person learning how to be an anti-racist. Um, and there's a plethora of conflicting information on racial issues, uh, police issues in this country. And so I wanted your thoughts on just a couple of uh, statistics and ideas. Um, one is that 83%, I've, I'm seeing 83% of whites are killed by other whites, um, largely because crime is a matter of proximity and opportunity. So who's going to drive across town to you know, uh, commit these types of crimes. It's done in your own community. Um, but I think the thing that I, I wanted your thoughts on most was the statistic that I see that unarmed blacks are two times more likely than unarmed whites to be killed by police. Well, first of all, uh, when it comes to interracial violence, that is, the, if you look at the universe of all black on white and all white on black, interracial violence, Blacks commit 88% of it. That's from the latest Bureau of Justice Statistics report on criminal victimization. Uh, as far as the ratio of Blacks and whites uh, being killed by the police, in as of June, the Washington Post was reporting that nine unarmed blacks had been killed by the police in 2019. That's out of 7,400 blacks who died of homicide. Uh, that's less than 1.1% of all black homicide victims. The, the Washington Post defines unarmed very generously to include people who are trying to steal an officer's gun or who are beating him with his own equipment or are driving away from a lawful car stop with a uh, with a loaded semi-automatic weapon in their car. The fact of the matter is when you take crime rates into account and violent crime rates into account, uh, the usual statistic that's reported in the media, which is that blacks have a two and a half times greater chance of being shot by a cop than whites, reverses completely. When you take violent crime rate into account, uh, whites are three times more likely to be shot by a cop. So just as the Criminal justice research has known for decades that the biggest predictor 
of officer behavior is civilian behavior. If, it's, if, an off, if a civilian resists arrest, which is what we've seen throughout this summer, uh, the officer is going to escalate his own use of force until he gains lawful compliance. So there simply is not a problem in this country of a racist epidemic of biased police shootings. That is not the case. The problem we have, again, is the very high rates of black victimization uh, by black criminals. And that is the civil rights concern that we should all be worried about. Next question is Gregory uh, Dolan. Uh, please remember to unmute your phone. Uh, go ahead, Gregory. Th thank you very much. Um, I want to take the, I want to catch the question perhaps broadening the conversation a little bit. Um, and, you know, we have law enforcement, not just with police officers on the street. We also have law enforcement from various um, state and local level administrative agencies who, you know, police who you bake cakes for and yeah. do other things like that. And, um, you know, they issue directives who can say what things on campus. And oftentimes they do tread on people's First Amendment rights and people's um, other liberties. And yet they too get, um, you know, protections from um, the qualified immunity doctrine. And so I just wonder whether the abolition of that doctrine uh, is, uh, you know, will have broader positive implications, not just kind of what's going to happen on the street, but what's going to happen in our civil society overall. And then I suppose uh, just a quick follow-up, if I may, is um, I, I guess a few from a law and economic perspective, given the fact that most judgments against police officers would probably be really judgments against the city that hired them, since the lawyers who sue would want to recover money as opposed to just bankrupting a police officer. Why, um, you know, why would given the fact that officers are not going to be personally liable, ultimately, why do you think that would affect how they personally do their job as opposed to how the cities train them and, you know, dispatch them, et cetera? Thank you. Robert or Kali, do you want to jump in? Sure. I mean, I, I certainly agree with the premise of the question, uh, which is that qualified immunity is a doctrine much more about the Constitution than it is about the police as an entity. And I think it's a healthier conversation to have about qualified immunity if we have it about the, the protection of constitutional rights rather than specifically about policing. I think po uh, the police are obviously one aspect of the government that interacts with the public and qualified immunity undeniably has implications for policing. Uh, but I think qualified immunity much more broadly has implications for our rights, our First Amendment rights, our property rights, and whether they're going to be protected the, the same way non-constitutional legal rights are. So I think that's, that's absolutely correct. And Cully has, has thoughts as well. The thing I would add is, in my mind, uh, as I was preparing for this discussion, which I very much enjoyed, and I want to thank everybody for, for joining uh, this group. It's been terrific. Thank you very much, Your Honor, for hosting it. Um, in my mind, there's a big difference between people who are on the front lines making split-second decisions and whether we reform or abolish a qualified immunity, and I think you know my position on that, and those who have a lot longer time to consider their actions uh, and so in my mind, there is a big difference between that. I want to pick up on one last thing that Heather said. Uh, in our rogue prosecutor series, we highlighted each of the rogue prosecutors. Kim Fox, in Chicago, you have a higher combat death rate, persons per year killed, than in the average year in Iraq or Afghanistan when we were in combat operations. Think about that. There is carnage going on in the streets there. You had a better chance of dying in Chicago than you did in Iraq or Afghanistan. And that's just not right. And so the cops have to wade into that morass and try to figure that out with the help of the, of the people. Uh, and so I just wanted to add that to get, give some people some food for thought. And I think the other thing I wanna say on the qualified immunity, this is about civil litigation and about monetary recovery. It does not relate to whether a law uh, officer is going to be disciplined, terminated, and or indicted. There is no chilling effect on that as it relates to qualified immunity. Prosecutors, on the other hand, have an absolute immunity as you, you talk about it. So I think you just want to keep things in perspective. I think what we've got to be careful of as we go into these debates, 
of what's going to move the needle and what's going to be helpful. Uh, I think we're looking at policies that improve policing and the relationships of police with communities. We have time for one more question and it's going to go to Martisa Bolano. Uh, sorry if I butchered your name. Uh, make sure to unmute your phone and go ahead. Martisa? You have you unmuted your feel, uh, your phone, Martisa? Uh, I. Yeah, you're you're there. We hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So my question really goes to the notion of abolishing qualified immunity, and what kind of effect would that have on recruitment and retention of a competent police force? and their supervisory personnel and making sure that we have experienced officers who can handle complex situations into the future. On his and work day as president-elect, Joe Biden turned his attention straight to his top priority. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll take a step. So, yeah, okay, thanks, Martisa. Well, go ahead, Larry. Um, two things. Um, Recruitment is down 40% across the nation for police officers. Uh, so in this age of trying to uh, find qualified individuals, you're seeing the standard get less and less for police departments around the country because no one wants to take these jobs. You're also seeing early retirement uh, at a disproportionate level of the seasoned officers. Um, so to, to your point, it's having a chilling effect and particularly your minority officers, if you watch what happened during the riots, though many of those officers were targeted harder than, than their white counterparts. They were either an Uncle Tom sellouts or any number of things that was just not healthy. So it's having a drastic, if qualified immunity was eliminated, you're, see, you're gonna see a downtick on those individuals who uh, is going to have to expose what few assets they do have to doing the job. Great, and I'm going to use my moderator's privilege to extend the panel a little longer and ask uh, Dan Morenoff. Why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Unmute your uh, phone, please, and go ahead. Uh, of course, and thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate that, uh, especially given the hour. Uh, I'll, I'll try to make this brief. Um, I know several of our speakers have um, several of our speakers have mentioned their concern that if we abolish qualified immunity and if a victim of whatever official action obtains a judgment uh, that the, the official in question will simply file for bankruptcy and that will be the end of it. I, I know I probably have more bankruptcy experience than most of the people involved in um, this panel, uh, but I find myself thinking that I'm fairly sure that any such judgment would have to involve a finding of mens rea, uh, as well as the fact that the bankruptcy code already makes non-dischargeable a number of kinds of claims, including intentional injuries. Uh, I, given that any, any claim a victim could have that would arise in this context would probably fall under that category, I, I find myself wondering, why would we make these particular intentional injuries dischargeable and no, no other intentional injuries are? And does that have any bearing on people's thoughts about whether that, that is or should be the end? If you look at insurance policies, even your insurance policy, if your act is intentional, you took your car and intentionally ran into someone, you're not gonna have coverage, number one. Uh, from a government aspect, if an officer has acted outside the scope and duties of his or her responsibilities or intentionally inflicted harm, then they're not going to be covered. Uh, they're going to be on their own. Uh, the cases that I've seen where officers go over to bankruptcy, and obviously you know this, the assessment of their financial wherewithal is the ability to pay. Uh, so it's not one of intentional because if it's intentional, you're not going to have insurance policy covering it. If you're intentional, you're not going to have a government uh, covering it. 
Thanks. Uh, we, we'll have one, one or two more calls. Ed Heimlich, are you uh, able to unmute and go ahead and ask your question? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, uh, my, my uh, question is going to be for um, Coley Stimson. But first, let me uh, say that uh, my uh, year, many years of experience dating back to the, uh, the tumultuous 60s and my uh, much research uh, since then, uh, the, our country survived for uh, most of its uh, existence without uh, providing um, any common law immunity for those employed at uh, public expense. Uh, but what happened in the 1970s was a reaction to the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, and it was an extension of the Cold, Floor, Cold War. Uh, our Supreme Court with uh, judges, uh, well, started with the federal courts with judges appointed by the Nixon administration, initiated a dirty war against the, uh, the American people. And uh, as a result, our incarceration rate over the next three decades grew to be by far the greatest in the entire world. Uh, and we are in fact a police state. My uh, question for Mr. Simpson is what is our common law? Is it the Declaration of Independence that says that all men are created equal and their reference was not to African-Americans, it was to the titled nobility in Europe, in, England, where the king was the sovereign, and those who acted in the king's name, including the British troops that were the uh, de facto police force in the colonies, were okay, thanks, Mr. Heimlich. above I think the law, the, had immunity. We, we get the question. So, Cully, why don't you go ahead and uh, answer? Sure. Uh, Mr. Heimlich, thank you for your question. Um, the common law that I was referencing and referring to was the very same common law that Scott Keller was referencing in his upcoming Stanford Law Review Law Review article, uh, which detailed uh, not only the four uh, tort treatises that the Supreme Court uh, and others turned to when looking at uh, the jurisprudence behind uh, torts and common law torts, uh, but also the cases throughout the state courts uh, that referenced uh, immunity. And so uh, we can have a philosophical debate, which I think is where you were headed on what the common law is per se, but what I was specifically referencing was what Scott Keller laid out in his uh, law review article, which I encourage you to read. Thanks, Colin. And now for the real last caller, I think we have a call in uh, from 360-862-9194. If you unmute your, uh, but, uh, your phone and go ahead and ask your question. A call, are you there? Okay, I think we might have lost him or her. So uh, we will end the panel here. Thanks everyone. This has been an enlightening discussion for sure. I'd like to thank uh, the panelists and the audience for joining us today. A reminder that the convention uh, starts again tomorrow morning with a discussion with professors Robert George and Cornell West on freedom of speech, freedom of thought, the Black Lives Matter movement, and the cancel culture. I'll start at 11 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. Thanks again.